This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. And welcome to the monthly public presentation of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Since 1990, the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii has been following our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education. As we've grown to become one of the largest all-volunteer, nonprofit vegetarian societies in the nation. We are proud to say that we are celebrating our 25th birthday this year. How many of you are here for the first time? A good number, thank you for coming. And how many of you are members? Also a good number, thank you very much for your support. Please remember that if you spend just $10 a week in groceries or eating out at our 5% discount level on a one year membership, you'll be saving money. And you can spend even less if you have, and save a lot of money if you've got a student membership or a multi-year membership or a family membership. So uh, you'll also be supporting events such as tonight's, which are not only made possible, but free to the community as well through your membership, dues and donations. You also get an informative newsletter. And uh, for those of you who missed the uh, previous newsletters because you haven't been a subscriber, just get on vsh.org. We've got them archived and I think you'll enjoy them. VSH members and friends can also enjoy popular social events such as our speaker dine-outs. It's now time for our special guest. We're delighted to have with us tonight, Dr. Grace Chen. <laughs> Dr. Grace Chen, um, Grace Chen, MD, is a board certified emergency physician who practices at Kuakini Medical Center. She grew up in New Jersey and obtained her undergraduate degree at Dartmouth College before returning to attend New Jersey Medical School in New York. She completed her residency in New York before moving to California where she practiced for eight years. She always loved visiting Hawaii and last year she decided to make Hawaii her home. Dr. Chen has been a vegetarian for over 20 years and became a vegan five years ago. She is passionate about leading a healthy lifestyle that includes avoiding animal products and practicing yoga. She is a strong advocate of preventing chronic disease through diet and lifestyle changes. She has a blog entitled 365 Days of Graceful Living at graceinhawaii.com with tips on living a healthy and vigorous vegan lifestyle. Dr. Chen's presentation tonight is entitled, Avoid a Trip to the ER with a Healthy Vegan Diet. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Grace Chen. Okay. All right, so the topic of my talk today is going to be about common things I see in the emergency room, and I see a lot of things that I think can be prevented with lifestyle changes, unfortunately, and people are to the point when they come to the emergency room that they cannot prevent some things, but sometimes they can, so I like to talk to patients about that. Um, some of the common things I see, I'm going to kind of list on the next slide, that things that can be prevented with a vegan diet. Uh, so there's actually a lot of things that I didn't list. Um, you don't have to remember all of these or anything, but basically I'm going to concentrate on the first four things because I didn't want to shortchange any topics. Uh, I, I wanted to talk about a million things when I was looking over this lecture and everything, but I didn't want to overwhelm people and make people really bored. So 
Uh, this is a report done by a couple of researchers, and they found that in-hospital adverse reactions totaled 2.2 um, million per year, and this is just in the hospital. Um, how many of you have experienced side effects from medications, you know, just outside of the hospital? Anybody had an allergic reaction? I mean, I had allergic, a lot of allergic reactions. We have a lot of patients coming into the emergency department with rashes, or uh, sometimes people get um, dangerous reactions to IV contrast, even um, procedures we do. So the um, second part of this is uh, how there are a lot of iatrogenic deaths, which are deaths kind of inadvertently caused by a physician and the medical treatment or diagnostic procedures we do. And they said in the U.S. there's annually 783,936, which is a lot. So if we can avoid these things with changing our lifestyle, I think that's optimum for everybody. So a little bit about myself. I became a vegetarian when I was 16 years old. A lot of my friends were doing it, and you know, when you're 16, you kind of do what all your friends do, and I'm lucky because my friends did something really good, and it's really benefited my health. So basically, um, I read this book, Diet for a New America by John Robbins, and he talked about the environmental effects of um, you know, eating animals and uh, some of the health effects and animal cruelty. And I never felt quite right about eating meat, so um, after this book, I decided I would no longer eat animals. It took a little while for me to become vegan just because there was a lot of pressure from my parents and other people telling me I wasn't getting enough protein and it wasn't as easy to be vegan back then as it is now. So, I mean, right now, it's, there's a lot of different products out there for vegans. There's substitutes for milk. Um, we have a lot of things, even substituting ice cream, which isn't really good for you, but, um, you know, if you crave something that's sweet, it's kind of nice to have it once in a while. So. Um, I feel like nowadays everybody's becoming vegan. I heard recently that Miley Cyrus was voted the sexiest vegan, and you know Al Gore is vegan now, and you know there's Natalie Portman, let's just Silverstone, some famous vegans, Ellen DeGeneres. Um, so, you know, I used to live in California, as Lorraine mentioned, and that's when I became vegan. I feel like there's a lot of vegans in California. There's a ton of restaurants. Um, more than we have in Hawaii, we're very, people in California are very lucky. I re heard about this book, The China Study, so I had read it, and after this book, I basically decided that I was doing a lot of harm to my body by eating animal products, and I didn't want to do that anymore, so that's when I became vegan. So these are some of the other potential side effects of diabetic medication. Um, I highlighted some that I think are really nasty, like kidney problems, and diabetics already have end organ damage from kidney problems, so um, I think this is actually just exacerbating their condition, and I think weight gain is another thing that's really terrible too, because diabetics have diabetes because they're generally, for the most part, they're overweight, and after they take these medications, they become more overweight, and then they require more medications, and they don't really get much better, they just require more and more medications and they're, they're oftentimes dependent on insulin when their pancreas burns out. So next slide I have is kind of explaining how people get type 2 diabetes. Oi, what do you think you're looking at? Belly fat can cause type 2 diabetes. You see, all our cells need glucose, a type of sugar, in order to function happily. The glucose is moved into the cells from your blood by insulin. Oh, hello. Don't mind me. Your belly fat, which is actually way more active than you think, bombards your cells with a mixture of chemicals that mean they don't respond as well to insulin, so the glucose can't get into your cells. This is called insulin resistance. This is not good news for you at all, is it? Soon, insulin resistance can lead to type 2 diabetes. And because your body doesn't take this lying down, your pancreas goes into overdrive, producing more insulin to compensate. Your pancreas can't keep this up forever. But your pancreas can burn out, producing less insulin just when your body needs more of the stuff. It's why having a large waist, and so more belly fat, increases your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. 
that's basically where you get dangerous levels of glucose in your bloodstream, which can damage your major organs. The good news is you can take our test to see if you're at risk right now. It only takes a couple of minutes and it gives you useful information you can share with your doctor. So this video kind of shows how diabetes is really a disease of fat. Um, in the next slide, I'm going to talk about the American Diabetes Association recommended diet. This is what a lot of physicians are recommending their patients do. I think this is very complicated. I probably couldn't figure this out myself, so I'm not sure how patients can really figure this out. Um, apparently you use uh, half the plate for non-starchy vegetables, a quarter of the plate for carbohydrates like grains, and then another quarter of the plate for lean protein, which they're saying is chicken or fish, and then you can have dairy on the side. So how do you think this diet measures up to the vegan diet? <laughs> It doesn't, exactly. So, and I'm not sure why we're recommending this, but um, this is the study done by Dr. Barnard. He compared the two diets, and there were 99 type 2 diabetics who participated, and they found that more of the vegan group was able to decrease their body weight, improve their hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of how well your sugars are controlled over the last three months, and therefore they were able to reduce their diabetic medication and an extra perk was that they decreased their LDL cholesterol which is the cholesterol that you do not want to be high. So I'm not sure why we're recommending a diet that is not as good as the vegan diet when there's been evidence that the vegan diet is more effective. So I'm going to talk about something next that's another thing that we see very commonly in the emergency room. It's a YouTube video that I found. Um, this woman actually was having a mini stroke and she pulled over to the side of the road to record herself. The patient apparently had gone into the emergency room and when she arrived there, she had had another mini stroke, that's why she'd gone in. And when she arrived there, the mini stroke was gone, so she wanted to record herself the second time she had it so she could prove to her doctors that it had happened. April 2nd at 6.42. And the sensation is happening again. Just a smile, they said. A smile. It's all tingling on the left side. On the, on the left side. The doctor said to breathe in, breathe out, manage distress. And I'm trying. I don't know why this is happening to me. It happened this morning again, and when I left the hospital Monday night at like 12.30 in the morning. So now I'm taking a picture for an example of what happens. It's 6.43. My hand is hard to lift up and to touch something, to touch my nose. So I didn't put the whole clip in because it's kind of long, but you kind of get an idea. So you'll see here, she kind of has slurred speech. Um, you'll see that she has some asymmetry of her face. She has a facial droop. So, and then later she kind of shows us that she has, uh, which I didn't include in the video, she has some discord, un uncoordination and she has weakness of her arm on one side. So how many of you have had a stroke or have had a family member with a stroke? Yeah. So my grandfather had a stroke not so long ago, and he used to be very active, but unfortunately after that, he was not able to walk as well anymore. He used to hike every day. And we get a lot of patients like that. I mean, even worse side effects of a stroke. A lot of people, they come into the emergency room, you know, we get young patients, they come in and they used to be able to do everything by themselves and then they can't walk anymore and they need to be placed in a care home because they don't have family members to take care of them. Or they may have family members, um, but you know, their family members um, basically end up having to stay home the whole entire time and uh, the person can't move, they often, you know, they can't eat a normal diet anymore, they have to have soft foods. They, some, sometimes they can't speak. It's, it's very difficult to get a stroke, it's very disabling. 
So right now, our current st treatment from stroke is basically a blood thinner called tissue plasminogen activator. Unfortunately, you can only get this if you present basically within the first few hours of your stroke. So a lot of people don't qualify for this. But even when you do qualify, you can have side effects such as bleeding in your brain. And um, you can also have bleeding in your gastrointestinal tract. But um, basically, the bleeding of the brain can be deadly. In the National Institute of Neurological Disease study, um, they basically said that one out of every 18 patients receiving the TPA bled into their brain, and 45% of the time, this was fatal. So this is not a very good treatment, really. It's, it's really unfortunate. Um, what happens when people get a stroke afterward? Uh, we, lots of times we put them on a blood thinner, too. If, even if they're not able to get the TBA to give it, begin with, they get put on Plavix or Coumadin or aspirin. And they also have increased risk of bleeding with those medications. Um, oftentimes, we'll see patients in the emergency room because of these uh, increased bleeding complications. A lot of times people come in with lacerations or cuts on their fingers or toes or whatever that they can't stop bleeding because they're on the blood thinner. Also, they fall and hit their head and um, they can have a bad head injury and basically have a hematoma in their head and uh, that can be life-threatening as well. A lot of people come in with bloody noses that won't stop bleeding because they're on a blood thinner too. So there's a lot of side effects from these blood thinners that we give for stroke. So in relation to this brain attack, I'm going to continue with the heart attack, which is like the same thing in the heart that I talked about previously in the brain. So my next clip. The heart is responsible for pumping oxygen-rich blood to the rest of the body, providing the energy that the body needs to function. The muscles of the heart itself also need a supply of blood. The coronary arteries, one of which we see here, fill that need. Sometimes a cholesterol plaque forms on the side of the artery, reducing blood flow. If part of that plaque breaks through into the artery, platelets tend to attach to it, creating a blood clot, further reducing or blocking blood flow. The blockage in the artery prevents blood from reaching part of the heart muscle. Without blood, the muscle is starved for oxygen, causing damage to the heart muscle. The heart attack occurs because the damaged heart can no longer pump properly. So he feels some pressure in his chest, which is a common complaint we get. You can have any diff amount of different symptoms like nausea, vomiting, sweating. Uh, some people get abdominal pain in their upper abdomen. And uh, some people are even not having symptoms and they have a heart attack sometimes. They just feel weak, older people. Um, how many people have had a heart attack or know someone who's had a heart attack before? A lot of people, right? So this is very common. This is actually the leading cause of death in the United States. About 610,000 people die of heart disease each year and 735 Americans have a heart attack. Okay, so anybody know what our current treatment for heart attack is an acute heart attack in the emergency room? Yes, yeah, stent. So um, we do cardiac caths, and these carry some risk factors. Basically, we put kind of like a little tube in the growing area that goes up to the heart, and if we see an occlusion or a clotted up area that's blocking uh, flow to a certain part of the heart, we see if we can open it up um, with this cardiac cath stent. Um, there's a lot of side effects to cardiac caths, including possible damage to your kidney from the contrast that we put in. And a lot of time, patients who get these cardiac caths, they already have kidney problems. But obviously, it's really bad to have a heart attack, so you have to weigh the risks and benefits. Sometimes if the vessels are too clogged and there's no way to improve them with a stent, the patient has to go for a bypass surgery, which is another very big surgery. Um, another thing that we try to do is we try to treat the risk factors of heart disease, which are seen in this slide here. So we tell patients to stop smoking. Um, can't do anything about male sex, and that's just something you can't have to live with. <laughs> and then um, 
We try to reduce the blood pressure with medications, treat the diabetes with medications, treat the cholesterol with medications, and we encourage exercise. The body mass index here is a measure of obesity. So that's why I'm saying encourage exercise and weight loss. So next slide, I'm gonna talk about some side effects of cholesterol medications. So basically, cholesterol medications have a lot of side effects, including having a liver problem. So you have to have your liver function tests checked just to make sure it doesn't damage your liver. You can have muscle breakdown that damages the kidney called rhabdomyolysis. You can have these other symptoms of bloating and cramping that lots of times discourage people from taking the medications and they'll just stop the medications against their doctor's advice, which is really bad too. Um, in addition, it also increases your risk of diabetes, which as we saw in the prior slide is already a risk factor for heart disease, so it kind of adds on your risk factors. Side effects of blood pressure medication, which we used to treat uh, another risk factor of heart disease, um, include drowsiness, impotence, which a lot of people don't want to admit they have, but they do have and they won't say anything about it. But it actually causes a lot of people to stop their medications, unfortunately. And people have frequent urination, which can cause dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. And that's another thing that a lot of people will stop their medications for. They just don't feel like taking them because they have to get up all night and urinate, and it's very distracting for their sleep. And already as an elderly person, you already kind of have more problems sleeping. So what if I said to you that instead of taking these medications, you could kind of make your heart disease better another way. Would you be willing to do that? Who would be willing to do that? I would be willing to do that, right? So this is a study done by Caldwell Esselstyn, a way to reverse heart disease. 198 patients with heart disease followed essentially a vegan diet without oil, and he also recommended against caffeine and sugary sodas and stuff like that. So in his group that was compliant with the diet, only 0.6% had a major cardiac event, which in this case it was one person with a stroke. And in the other group, there were people who weren't able to comply with the diet. It was too difficult for them, about 21 of them. 62% of these patients had adverse cardiac events. So as you can see here, there is a big difference. The people who were compliant with the vegan diet basically were able to reverse their heart disease. And the people who were not kind of just got worse. This is another study done by Dr. Dean Ornish, Intensive Lifestyle Changes for Reversal of Coronary Heart Disease. There's 48 patients with heart disease either followed the advice of their personal physician, which was a control group, or the Dean Ornish lifestyle changes. So Dean Ornish uh, recommends a 10% whole foods vegetarian diet, exercise, stress management, smoking cessation, and there's some group psychosocial support. The other group that was following the advice of their personal physicians we're not exactly sure, it doesn't really say in the paper what the personal physicians recommended, but on a general basis, they were probably put on some medications that I had talked about before to control their risk factors, and then probably they would uh, recommend the patient not eat red meat or something like that. So the major difference was probably uh, in, in these two groups were just the diet primarily. So Basically, coronary artery disease improved in Dean Ornish's lifestyle change group, whereas the control group's coronary artery disease progressed, and they had two times more cardiac events occur in the control group. So basically, in this study, you can see that patients who were following the standard treatment for heart disease were really getting no better and getting worse, whereas if they just went on a vegan diet, they got a lot better. Um, also, in addition to that, uh, Dean Ornish just talked about in the study how the experimental group was actually not taking any statin or lipid-lowering drugs, whereas the control group was. And even with that, the experimental group's symptoms improved uh, more than the control group. So the lipid-lowering drugs are actually not as effective as the vegan diet. So it strikes me as strange that we give these medications when we can tell people to change their lifestyle instead, and it's 
actually a lot cheaper than the medications. We spend a lot as a nation paying for medications. And the medications have a lot of bad side effects for patients. So we're very lucky, actually. Um, coming to Hawaii in September is the Dean Ornish program. So um, it's going to be on the waterfront, I think, near Ala Moana. And we have someone special here tonight. His name is Dr. Kevin Lum. Stand up. Yeah. So he's going to be heading up the study. So if anyone has any cardiac problems, uh, this is a cardiac re rehab program, kind of following the study structure that I talked about in the prior slide. And this is the contact information for the program. You can also go to Kevin at the end of the lecture. And this is the phone number if you'd like to enroll. Uh, they have a lot of support with this program, and I think it'll be a nice way to transition to a vegan diet if you're looking to do that. So next I'm going to talk about blood pressure and how a vegetarian diet can help blood pressure. This is a study done not on vegans but vegetarians. I think if it was done on vegans, probably the vegans would be even better off than vegetarians. Um, basically, um, as you can see in this slide, that the blood pressure was much lower in the vegetarian group. Very few of the vegetarians had high blood pressure at all. And most of them had normal blood pressure compared to the controls, which are people who ate meat. And in this study, they postulated that potassium, the higher amount of potassium in vegetables specifically was one of the reasons why vegetarians have lower blood pressure. They s noticed an increased output of potassium in the urine, and that's how they came to this conclusion. Next, I'm going to talk about nutrient profiles of vegetarian and non-vegetarian. So basically, this is a large study done on Seventh-day Adventists, and they compare the dietary patterns of different Seventh-day Adventists with different dietary patterns, going from people who eat meat to pesco, you know, people who eat fish kind of vegetarians, to lacto-ovo-vegetarians, people who don't eat any animals but eat dairy products and eggs, and vegans. So they found that the BMI the, was highest in the non-vegetarian meat-eating people and lowest in the strict vegetarians, which seems sort of obvious, but you know there was a study done, and everyone knows that now, but back then maybe it wasn't that obvious. So I'm going to talk about something next that's been kind of big on the news and on YouTube and everything. It's called the paleo diet. How many of you have heard of the paleo diet? So. Basically, I think the premise behind this is that when we were cave people, we would hunt and eat meat, and then, you know, so meat is okay because that's what we used to do, and not to eat processed foods. And I think that part is good, the part about not eating processed foods, but I don't really agree with the meat eating part because I think it was probably really hard to get meat because the, you had to run after it with a bow and arrow or whatever kind of tools they were using back then. And, they were probably getting a lot more exercise running after it. And right now, we can just pull up to McDonald's and get whatever kind of meat we want with very little effort. So I have a fun little video that I found on YouTube. I don't know if you guys have seen it before. It uh, kind of compares the people who are paleo to the people who are vegan. The guy says he couldn't get a lot of paleo volunteers. I'm kind of wondering why. <laughs> there were a lot of vegan volunteers, so I had to cut this, this show kind of early here. <laughs> me, Harley, can you please do a video just showing some physical descriptions of paleo girls versus vegan girls? So this video is not about you know saying anyone's bad or better or whatever, it's just merely a, it's more of just like a, what's the word, sort of a scientific blogger sort of YouTube video just demonstrating what the body looks like long term on a high fat diet and then long term on a high carbohydrate plant based vegan diet. Now I got these photos from the net from my forum. Um, sent to me personally a lot of these photos from the PETA website as well so these are genuine legit photos and I had a I've got to say I had a real big struggle finding enough paleo girls um, that wanted to be on the net so there's only a couple there but stay with me and uh, let's check it out so again this is not to make fun of anyone or anything it's just more of a just a, a, an example this is what happened if you eat a certain way this is how you look long term so let's start rolling
All right, so I'm going to talk about something next that's a little bit nasty. Nobody sort of wants to talk about it, but everybody is obsessed about it. And people come in for this problem a lot in the emergency room, more than you'd think. Can anyone guess what I'm going to talk about next? That's right. I'm going to talk about constipation. So this is a major problem, apparently, in the United States. A lot of people suffer from this. I did an Amazon search. And I saw like 954 hits on books about curing constipation. So this is a major concern about people, if people can write all these books and actually make money off of selling these books on constipation. If you go to the doctor and you're constipated, a lot of these doctors will give you medications, which cause side effects, again, like we were talking about. Stomach cramps, burping, nausea, electrolyte imbalance. And some people, after they take these medications, they have runny stools. And so they come into the emergency room. They said, I was constipated, but then I took a laxative, and now I have diarrhea. So I mean, what am I supposed to do? Give them another, you know, something to stop them up, and then they'll have the other problem. They come back again. So it's kind of like a continuing cycle here. So I talk to patients a lot, and I tell them they really have to change their diet to get to the root of the problem. These laxatives are not the answer. So I'm basically recommending fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, beans. Basically, things in the plant kingdom are the only thing with fiber. So I brought a few different things today, and I'm going to ask you how much fiber you think they have. Or I have a few things on my slide. My first thing is this. So what is this? It's, it's spinach, that's right. So this is about 100 grams of spinach. How much fiber do you think this has? Mm -hmm. Six grams. Um, close, but not quite. A little bit lower. 100 grams, 100 grams of it. It has a lot of fiber. I mean, mind you, this is only 23 calories. So basically, this has 2.2 grams of fiber. So if you eat about 100 calories of this, you'll get almost 10 grams of fiber, which is really good because you're only having 100 calories and you're getting a ton of fiber for the 100 calories. So basically, you can be very thin on this, you know, and still have your bowel movement every day. So this is a very good source of fiber. So my next thing is something else, an apple. How much fiber do you think a medium apple has? Anyone? Oh, someone said the answer up here. They just have to say it louder. Oh, no. Someone said it here. Someone said four. Yes, I did. Yes, very good. So it has four grams of fiber. So, and it's only 95 calories, too. Delicious apple, four grams of fiber and 95 calories. So this is a very good source of fiber as well. So how much fiber do you think an egg has? Zero, that's right. An egg has zero fiber, but it has saturated fat <laughs> and it has cholesterol. So if you want to get your saturated fat and cholesterol, that's a good way to get it out of the way, but it has no fiber. Hamburger? Zero, that's right. You guys are smart. <laughs> so no fiber. A lot of fat, nine grams of fat. Cholesterol, 70 milligrams. So a lot of cholesterol and fat. So I have a little slide here, that a little chart I made about the different fiber and different things. Avocados have a lot of fiber, so the top two things are plants um, or vegetables, and then I have beans. Beans also are a great source of fiber. Then I have seeds and nuts, um, and quinoa and brown rice. Brown rice actually has a good amount of fiber. For one cup, there's four grams, and then of course animal products have no fiber. So a lot of people say when they come in, you know, they're constipated or their family members constipated, they'll say, oh, mom, all they eat is pasta and rice all the time. But actually, even white rice has 0.6 grams of fiber. So, you know, it's, it's partly the, I mean, it's partly, yeah, it's, it is processed, but it actually has more fiber than meat. So the worst thing you're doing for yourself is eating meat because that, if you're constipated, that is really making it a lot worse. 
And unfortunately, Americans eat a lot of meat. So 90% of Americans do not meet their daily fiber recommendation of 30 grams per day. Fiber consumption is only about half of that. So this is a slide, a study done on the bowel transit times. As you can see here, which, so the top is, uh, you think it's non-vegetarians or vegetarians. So this, the bottom part is, the bottom of the chart is basically the number of hours it takes for some poop to pass. And then they have male and females on different sides. They separate out the females for every one reason are more constipated than males. And then they have non-vegetarians and vegetarians. So the non-vegetarians are at the top. You see that it takes them anywhere from one to five days to pass their stool. And as you can see here, the vegetarians, they are a lot quicker with passing their stool. So it's basically not as much of a problem. I personally cannot imagine not having a bowel movement for five days. But I will say that when I was 16, one of the big benefits I got with turning vegetarian is I never had constipation again. Because actually, I had battled constipation even in my teenage years, probably because I was eating too much meat and not very healthy. So that's one of the big benefits I got turning vegetarian. And I'm very grateful for that. So um, constipation is not just bad because it's uncomfortable. Um, it also can cause other things like hemorrhoids. Anyone had hemorrhoids before? No one's going to admit it. <laughs> so um, hemorrhoids um, can be internal or external. Internal, you can't really feel them. Um, external, they're very painful. And a lot of people come in with external hemorrhoids um, and internal hemorrhoids. Uh, sometimes people come in with internal hemorrhoids and they're bleeding. And the bleeding can be life-threatening. So um, it's actually, it can be dangerous, too, to have hemorrhoids. Does anyone know what this thing is? Prolapse. Yes, it's a rectal prolapse. So this is very, very uncomfortable. So people come in to the emergency room with this, and basically we have to give them sedation and we push it back in. But sometimes it falls out again, and sometimes they need a permanent surgery to make it better. So what happens in this case is the rectum kind of just comes out of the anus, and it's usually from a lifetime of constipation. 50 to 75 percent cases are attributed to constipation. So I have an, another video next about the other problems you can get with constipation. Here we see a colonoscopy of a patient with acute hematochesia. After extensive rinsing of old and some fresh blood in the sigmoid, we see multiple diverticuli and this adherent blood clot. A peristaltic flushing pump is used to flush the blood clot away. Indeed, under the clot we find diverticula. At the base of the diverticula, the reddish nipple represents a small ruptured artery that is the likely cause of the bleeding. However, spontaneous bleeding already resolved at this moment. Government in 2011 by dairy, livestock, poultry, egg, and processed foods. And the dairy industry spent one, more than one million of, on lobbying in 2012. And because, you know, the more subsidies go to support meat, people can get meat cheaply, you know, and this is a dollar menu. I mean, it's unbelievable that meat is so cheap for people. I mean, these cheeseburgers are only a dollar, and if you are a poor patient and you just want something quick to give to your kids, uh, you know, you get home after a long day, you're going to go to McDonald's and you're going to go to the dollar menu. So I think we need to support more healthy food options. This is another problem. We have this choosemyplate.gov and they're advocating, I mean they do have fruits, grains and vegetables, but they're advocating under this protein, they basically essentially mean meat because, you know, basically they don't think vegetables have protein. And here they advocate dairy, but you know, actually vegetables have plenty of protein. They have enough protein. The recommended daily allowance for protein is 10% of your calories. And as you can see here, a lot of vegetables and fruits and plant products have greater than 10% of protein. And um, you know, some fruits have less, but basically if you're eating a good combination of these things, you're not gonna be deficient in your protein. It's, it's not really a problem. Um, so I think we need to just, kind of 
hopefully some there will be some changes happening and they will adopt this new plate from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine where they just recommend plant products. There's no meat in this plate. I think this is this would be a great new start for us. So in conclusion, I want to say that I see so many things that can be preventable or reversible by diet and lifestyle changes and I kind of wanted to make a change so I started to do a blog um, where I talk about different health problems and this is Grace with Graceful Living. Today we're going to make brownie bites. You will need cocoa, dates, almonds, and walnuts. I add a half cup of baking cocoa first. Then I add one cup of dates. Then one cup of almonds. And one cup of walnuts last. I'm using the pulse function on the food processor until I get my desired consistency. Here again, I'm using the S blade. Desired consistency is when the mixture rolls up in a neat little ball. Now I take my S blade out for safety before I start rolling little balls of brownie bites. They were gonna fly a GoPro on a kite at the top of the mountain. it's time for our brownie bites. Brownie bite? Yeah. How do you like it? I like it. Delicious. Great. Mm.
And there's enough other kinds of patients coming in, so I'm not concerned. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Grace Chen, for this really enlightening presentation. Uh, I guess there is a lot to be learned from uh, the role that, uh, from an emergency physician's point of view, of the role that uh, uh, people's diets and their medications play in whether or not they need to go to the emergency room for a visit. And if you don't want to have to go and visit Grace, uh, Dr. Grace Chen, in a, a uh, you know, a, in a professional capacity, <laughs> Um, I think there's a lot of information you can take away with you tonight about this. And we'd like to now invite all of you to have some delicious, free, vegan refreshments over by the kitchen that are donated by the generosity of Down to Earth. Mahalo to all of you for coming and have a safe return home. Good night, everyone. <laughs>